Uh, so, Father, we come here this morning uh, admitting that we, we don't just need your help. Uh, we need you to radically intervene in our lives, in our minds, in our spirits, uh, to give us a hunger for you, a greater knowledge of you. Lord, unless you revealed yourself to us, unless you told us and showed us exactly what you wanted us to know, we would never discover it. We would never come to maturity apart from your grace from your gentle, leading, guiding hand. And we thank you for that, Lord, that we can cry out for help, we can, we can uh, understand you more, we can grow closer to you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, I always preface our like, little practical things, like um, just to do a quick like overview of what we did uh, uh, the last two times, which we'll just, well, the last time, we just went over the foundational articles list. Um, so we have a, a, a list and a, um, of resources to help you grow. And so uh, everybody, you know, every organization, every church does something like that, uh, that wants to help their people grow, whether it's uh, on your job, they usually could do like... Uh, ongoing training, um, a lot of jobs do tuition reimbursement because they want you to get a higher education and uh, because that'll help their company better and uh, they'll have more knowledgeable employees to create a better product, uh, which will be a greater business, which will probably give them more money or something, whatever their end goal is, I don't know. Uh, but if it's a business, it's probably money uh, or a service or a resource or a product, right? And so um, our product, not that we are a business, we are not geared towards money, we're geared towards people, right? Everyone's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you think differently, just talk to me later uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we are invested in people, right? That's not like new knowledge for anybody. Um, and so our product is mature people. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of model of discipleship that Jesus laid out, um, how that fits into the epistles, how that fits into churches and cultures, and uh, then what do we do about it. Um, because what's hard, in, just to be honest, like what's hard in people's minds is when we study theology, let's just talk about um, an attribute of God like his... Uh, omnipotence. God is like all powerful. He is all, all the power comes from him, all the power flows through him, and all the power returns to him. You know, and the power we have as human beings is, is not like his. And so we understand things theologically, and the first product that the Lord wants us to, uh, or wants to produce in us is, is awe and glory back to himself, right? Create uh, worship, create spirits and hearts that worship the Lord. And uh, then after that, we're like, okay, what do we do about it? What do we, now that I have this knowledge of God, uh, besides just like singing a couple songs on Sunday morning, what do I do, right? And so for a lot of us, it's hard to take that uh, and figure out what is that like next step um, if we emphasize theology and biblical studies and all these things, um, which we do, and then Sometimes it's just hard for us as people to say, okay, what do I do about that? What's the, uh, what do I have to do next, right? Um, which sometimes is the right question and sometimes is not the right question, but we'll get into that later. Uh, the first answer is always glorify the Lord, worship him and serve him. But, so our theme verse that I'm using, the only verse that, uh, if you're following with my Sunday morning teachings, the only verse that I'm repeating is Colossians 1, 8, I'm sorry, 1, 28, and 29. Which says, In him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. And so, um, one of my hopes is, uh, I might put these on a sheet or something um, next week I'll, or next time I do Sunday mornings. I'll do scripture sheets 
but uh, as a resource. Um, but today we're doing the foundational book list. Uh, but one of those scripture sheets I'll make, if you're following any of my teachings on Sundays, which probably one of you, two of you, two of you are, and uh, is all of the Bible verses we're going to talk about lead to epistemology or knowledge uh, about God's knowledge and about what our knowledge is. And so all of that ties together. And so every Sunday that I'm up here, I give about five or six uh, very poignant Bible verses about knowledge and what is our responsibility to knowledge and how do we get more knowledge. And so uh, you can jot those down and write those down in your notes or whatever, research them later. Um, I'm very encouraged. Uh, I'm, I don't know if uh, the right terminology would be a realist. You might think what I'm about to describe is a pessimist, but it doesn't matter whatever label you put on there. Um, is that I'm very encouraged that when I get up here on Sunday mornings, and I'm, I know uh, not everybody is here on, at the 9.30, right? When we sit down here for 10.30, we get about the other 50% of people that attend our church. And for whatever reason, that's okay. Um, for, in my, it's not okay, but, it's, <laughs> but for what I'm about to say, uh, it's okay in my eyes because I know uh, that I'm really only talking to a couple people who are really going to get it. That's not okay, though. Uh, and so when we're going over these practical things, I've been very encouraged that every time I get up here and I say, you can invite yourself over to my house, we can talk about evangelism, we can talk about the uh, articles, I can print them out for you, I'll make a scripture sheet for you, um, we'll do, I'll do whatever you want to make it easier and more accessible for you so that you can grow. And every time I say that and go into a topic like the book list that we're going to do today, Somebody comes up and says, hey, can you help me? And that's encouraging to me, because if nobody was doing that, I would be really sad. Um, and there'd be something majorly wrong, and it might be a problem with me, but it, it might not. It might be my style or something. Um, it might be that everyone is already more mature than I think. That would be amazing. Um, but anyways, I'm very encouraged that like when you know, there's been people that have, uh, and I'll say it again, on any of these topics, with any help, anything I can do for you, you can invite yourself over to my house. My wife will make you dinner because you don't want me to make dinner. And she'll probably make dessert too. We can have homemade ice cream. We do it about every four to five days anyways. So there's always fresh batches of homemade ice cream. Um, and uh, we can talk about topics. We can talk about theology. We can help you get started in any of these resources. I'll make you scripture sheets. We'll go over the foundational book list. We'll go over articles. Um, whatever it is, uh, my household is an open door. And I'm guessing you can do that with just about anybody on our leadership team or uh, who's halfway mature. Um, and so for just to make a couple other points before we get into the uh, into the scriptures is that this is for heads of households. This isn't just for you individually to help you grow because it's all about you. We are a community of people who uh, live in fellowship and community with one another to help each other grow. And the scriptures make that clear that you don't just grow to maturity uh, on your own, isolated in your room by yourself, studying. That is one method that the Lord uh, gives us to help us grow. But the community is, is a huge piece to it. And so heads of households, uh, single brothers households, single sister households, moms, dads, uh, whatever, for you, this is supposed to help you to, to, to lead other people, to make disciples to, in very practical steps. Um, use these resources as just like a matrix of like where, where we're going, right? We all know the saying, if you, um, uh, if you don't, what's that? Well, man, just came into my head and I lost it. What's that saying? You guys can talk back to me. Uh, when you don't have a plan, uh, when you fail to plan, you're planning to fail, right? That's a truthism out there. And so this is all about just like helping everybody mature, right? Colossians 1 says that everybody that Paul um, is is teaching Christ and warning everybody and teaching everybody 
that he might present everyone mature. And so everybody has an equal opportunity to be a mature Christian, right? Everybody has uh, uh, the same opportunity. Now, you might say, well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't do this. Uh, my dad wasn't a pastor. Well, either was mine. Um, and so you can make a tons of excuses that might say that it's unfair, and that might be the truth. Uh, it might not be fair, but everybody has the equal opportunity, and it is equally important to see um, that Paul makes no excuses for anybody, um, whether they grew up in a pagan culture, whether they visited temple prostitutes for most of their life, or whatever. Everybody can be mature. He doesn't limit that. Um, and so that word mature is, I'm using the ESV, and so the word mature in the King James is, is translated perfect, but the Greek word is, is teleos. So what is teleology? We'll throw this one out there. Teleology. The end goal, the purpose, right? Um, so it's that the purpose for all of us in Christ is to be mature. It's not just that we each have an equal opportunity, but Paul's saying, that is the purpose of which Christ redeemed us and he created us is to be mature Christians, right? It's not just that we all have an equal opportunity and like, you know, um, like we do vocations. Well, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, church assistant and this guy does plumbing and this guy is a PhD doctor or something uh, or a girl or uh, this guy's an engineer. doesn't matter, right? It's not like we all have this equal opportunity to become something and it's all different in certain analogies that's true but when it comes to maturity everybody's purpose is maturity there's nobody who is in christ who he isn't wanting to be mature right hopefully that's not new news but we have to really understand that um, because everybody is called to it and so the reason why i'm doing the practical things like we're going to go over the foundational book list today and usually I leave myself like between three to eight minutes to do the, like what I gave you an outline on the book list, but I'm gonna to try to leave myself more time. But the reason why we do practical things is because um, I think everyone's experienced this, right? Like um, I can uh, take a math course and I can look at videos, right? And, but if I don't ever practice it or if I don't ever do it and grasp it with my own hands, it's going to be very hard for me to actually say I have an understanding of these math concepts, right? And then what is every high school kid who doesn't want to do math? It's like, why are we learning all these things? What's the purpose? When am I going to use it, right? When am I going to use calculus? When am I going to... Uh, short little sidebar, because I like sidebars. Uh, is I remember when we were at the old church and we were remodeling, um, and there was a... a uh, the entryway. You guys remember that at the old church building? There's a four-year way. There's the, you come in the first double doors. There's two doors on the, one door on the left, and there's another double door, and there's that four-year way. It's not square, and there's, um, I think there was one light sort of in the middle, and we we're remodeling, and I had to find out, like, where to put these other lights, and I had to use Pythagorean's theorem to figure it out. I was like, oh, this is, what, this is why I went to high school and learned Pythagorean's theorem, so that I could remodel the church for your way and put in the lights in the right spot to make it uh, somewhat even. And so, um, so with all these things, you might be thinking uh, with the practical things, why do we need this? It's because when Paul says that we're teaching everybody with all wisdom, what the scriptures don't do is give us a step-by-step -step guide how to bring somebody to maturity, as in, well... Have them read this, and then have them read this, and then if you come up with this issue, then the answer is this. We're working with people. We're dynamic creatures. We're made in the image of God. Um, each person is intricately different from everybody else. And so the scriptures were never intended to be a step-by-step -step field guide or manual to bring somebody to maturity, right? There's several, uh, there's tons of instruction, there's tons of, commands, there's tons of uh, promises, but never was it intended to say, okay, here's step one, and here's step two, and here's step three, and you have to do them in this order, and when someone's done this, then they're a real Christian, and when they've done this, this is how they've reached maturity, 
right? It's not just checking off different things. And so it becomes extremely practical. We talked about that the other week with the foundational articles. Of Those are just articles, short um, little abbreviations to topics that you can uh, breach in about like 15 minutes or less just to help you open up your mind to a new concept or something maybe biblically you haven't quite uh, dove into yet. And so uh, make no mistake, when Paul was in like Ephesus for 18 months, um, he wasn't just like standing on the street corner and preaching and then some people wanted to hear more and become Christians and he talked to them on Sunday mornings and preached and then sent them home uh, to come back next week, right? Uh, he labored, he met with people, he had teams with him, uh, he probably met with them daily, you know, around his work schedule because he was bivocational. Um, and, right? and so it becomes extremely practical to bring someone to maturity and it has to be done in wisdom. There's no step-by-step guide, right? And it's more like, uh, there's not, the majority of us aren't parents in this room, but those of you who know anything about kids, um, or, or even who took the counseling course. You can take that counseling course on like how to raise kids. You can read all the best books, but uh, that'll help you open up your mind to certain top topics and um, things maybe you need to correct in your parenting, but it's not going to give you a step-by-step guide on how to raise a kid, right? Uh, that's just how it is. And so when we're, when we're talking about discipleship and when Paul talks about bringing someone to maturity or presenting people mature in Christ. It has to be done in wisdom. It has to, it's going to meet itself out in the practical ways, right? We have to get the big picture, the, the, the overarching topics and, and different things, but for each individual person, it's going to be like a, what do we do next? We've got to think about it. We've got to pray about it. What would be good for this person? And that's why we're part of, and we are a shepherding movement that does one-on-one discipleship so that we can really make it easier for us to meet those things out in practical ways. And so, there's the first Bible verse. We got five more to go, uh, <laughs> right? And so, just think about this. I'm just kind of throwing this out here before we get to the foundational book list. Um, when you read in Matthew 28:20, 20, the Great Commission that says, "Go and make disciples of all nations," a lot of times we divorce in our mind that Paul or uh, Paul that Jesus said this, and that's the Great Commission, and then. The apostles did that, and we don't hear much about them, and then we kind of divorce in our mind the epistles from making disciples, right? Does that kind of make sense where I'm going with that? And so, um, and we would think maybe, at least if you guys think how I've thought before, of when the disciples go out and plant churches and, and do things, that was them making disciples, but then how they wrote the letters and followed up with them was not, right? Or it's not easily you know prevalent in our minds and so but um just like acts 1 8 brings out you know that says when jesus says like wait in jerusalem for then you will receive power from on high and then you'll be my witnesses in judea samaria and jerusalem until the ends of the earth well the whole book of acts is about that right this is what they did and uh up until their death they were all about that being witnesses to Jesus and making disciples. So uh, when the epistles are written and all of the New Testament scriptures are written, it's about making disciples, right? So we don't want to divorce that from our minds of how, how the New Testament writers are uh, writing and the direct command from Jesus was to make disciples. And so I bring that into play because uh, we're going to read Second Peter 1, 5 through 11. This was one, uh, as a new Christian about eight years ago who lived a life of debauchery, I love this Bible verse because uh, in, in my mind, very practically speaking, I was like, okay, this tells you things to focus on, and I can do that, right? I just need like something to keep my mind straight, right? So Second Peter 1, 5 through 11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement... In the ESV, the NASB says, applying all diligence. Like, do this really, really, give everything you got. Uh, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, 
and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there, stop these qualities, pursue these qualities. We'll get into how to understand them or what they mean, you know, uh, in a little bit. But he says very quickly, very briefly, pursue these qualities. These are the qualities that are going to keep you from being unfruitful and unproductive, right? So that's huge, right? Don't, uh, don't gloss over what Peter says. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Uh, you know, I was, um, grew up in the church, was, had no fruit in Christ, was not a, a genu- genuine, regenerate Christian. And I was tired of uh, falling. <laughs> it hurts, right? Uh, uh, like when, for both my daughters, for Lily and Mariah, when I taught them how to ride their bike uh, and started to get to the point when they removed their training wheels, they would be like wobbling and falling, right? And I'd be like, well, if you're tired of falling, I'm going to teach you, put your feet down. If you feel like you're going to fall, start using your brake, right? And because it's not natural for them, uh, you know, on kids' bikes, you have to pedal backwards for brakes. And so it's not natural. When they freak out and they think they're falling, they're going to put their feet down. And if they're going too fast, their foot's going to catch. And that's going to cause them. And they're going to turn their bike over and fall. And they don't want to ride their bike anymore because they keep falling. Well, if you're tired of falling, pump the brakes, right? They, like I had to teach them both that as we remove the training wheels and we're going faster, you need to start learning to teach yourself to pedal backwards. And the brakes will be on, you'll slow down, and you won't fall right? That's what Peter's saying. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. If you're tired of falling, if you're tired of being unfruitful and unproductive in the Lord, focus on these, right? Uh, Verse 11, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, we don't preach legalism. We don't preach that uh, apart from grace, you could be saved, or apart from grace, you could mature, or apart from grace, you could do anything in the Lord, right? He's saying if you're, you're going to make your calling and election sure, um, the very uh, premise of for this very reason in Peter, you can read verses uh, 3 and 4 that says that um, we have the knowledge of Christ, we have these promises, uh, and that he has given us every, everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Right, his, his precious and very great promises. Because we have everything, because Christ is pouring out everything on us, he's already given us grace, therefore we can practice these qualities. These qualities are not going to save us. Right? They're not going to save us in the sense of, uh, of, of humanism. If I do this, then I will be set free from depression, anxiety, low self-image, uh, whatever, you know, whatever, um, or certain besetting sins, right? It's because we have the promises, because we have the grace of God, we can therefore practice these qualities and bring us into fruitfulness in the Lord. And so these qualities aren't, um, although a lot of uh, 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 church historians and theologians, capstone qualities of of faith and love as the two end stones, um, but these aren't like, oh, I got faith now, um, I need to, I need to practice, uh, like virtue. I need to like work on my moral character. And then once I've perfected that, then I'll go to knowledge. And then once I have all the knowledge, then I can go to self-control, <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. All of these are to be increasing at all times. And so we gloss over, um, we gloss, I just think in those, uh, even, you know, when I took these, uh, and kind of made these like the verses of my life or for a period of time, I kind of glossed over knowledge too, right? Because you're like, knowledge, okay, what should I study? And you're like, I don't know. Uh, well, that's why we're here, <laughs> right? That's why we have a foundational book list. Um, 
We're not talking about studying mathematics. We're not talking about studying the sciences. The Lord's not saying, Peter's not saying um, that if you study philosophy in the Western tradition and if you study math and science, then you're going to be fruitful and productive in the Lord, right? What are you studying? Well, the things he pre-qualified that with, uh, all things that pertain to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him, uh, his precious and very great promises. And so um, we generally think, to think about theology, uh, but that's not necessarily the end of it. Theology is just the beginning, right? Um, uh, there's in the King James, there's a proverb out there somewhere that relates in the paraphrased King James version in my head, says, uh, so a man thinketh, so, or as a man thinketh, so he is, right? And so I'm just using that verse to say that the Bible purports that uh, in our mind starts ideas and those produce fruit. And so that's how the gospel is practically met in the world. People preach with words those ideas to uh, start infecting their heart and the Holy Spirit uses those words that people preach to change lives. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty powerful. Um, he does and he changes whole cultures, right? And so these aren't, these aren't necessarily sequential. They're all supposed to be increasing and we rarely think of knowledge. Um, and so, again, I like to talk to you people. Uh, what's, somebody give me an overview. What is Second Peter all about? The whole book is about like one thing. Anybody bold enough to just shout it out? Jesus. It is about Jesus, but what is uh, Peter particularly addressing? Right, he's reminding them about some of the higher things, right? And one of the first things he addresses is false teachers, right? Uh, he says, he goes on for about two and a half chapters about like, here's the qualities of false teachers, and this is what you should look out for, and here's how you identify them. He doesn't name anybody by name. Uh, uh, Paul does in his writings. <laughs> and, uh, and I think in one of the... One of, the, uh, one of the Johns, but, um, but Paul does. For he doesn't name anybody by name, but he says, watch out for people like this. This is what they're doing. They're going to lead you away from Christ, right, with these teachings, right? So if you don't think that studying and knowledge and gaining a greater depth of what the Lord is doing is important, um, then read Second Peter, right? It's, he's, he's very clearly, the first thing he warns them about is false teaching, and so, um, you know, so he, there's blatant false teachers there's, that lead him away, like, uh, like Arians and things in the first couple centuries, the heresies that arose um, that, that Paul pr predicts or prophesies that will come so that the way of truth will be known. Um, but I'm just going to throw out there uh, of why the foundational book list, why these resources, why these things are so important is because there's blatant false teachers out there we can go to uh, uh, that are in the name of Christ, like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons who are Christian cults, who are blatant, right? We're not, I'm not, so I don't think, uh, I think those are dangerous, but I don't think that's what we're concerned about here is becoming, becoming Mormons. Is anybody in, anybody in danger of becoming a Mormon next week? Let me know. Uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk at lunch. Uh, but what is, I think, prevalent and what is kind of more nefarious and unseen is just low theologies and low expectations that affect our church, affect the Western church, affect our culture, and that slowly lead us away from Christ. And I don't, I'm not saying this because that's all those churches out there and that doesn't affect us. I'm saying what happens, uh, what sin does to us is... Is, and what Satan wants to do is a slow progression so that we don't even notice that we've been focusing on works and we've been led away from life in the Spirit and we've been led away over multiple years from a genuine, uh, passionate love for Christ uh, and his mission as the church. And so that's our concern. 
That should be everybody's concern because we can have an appearance of maturity uh, like in Matthew 13, Luke 8, Mark 4, the parable of the sower. The third seed grew up to be a, this mature-looking tree. Right? It was big. It had leaves. It filled the garden, but it had no fruit. It's youth, useless. It's good for firewood. It can't even produce another seed that could hopefully produce fruit in another tree. Right? Um, and so... There are certain things uh, in our hearts and there are certain things in our lives that lead us away from maturity. So it's something that we have to continually think about um, and, and go after. And so uh, we've got two more Bible verses and then we're getting into the practical thing. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they should be found faithful. Uh, Paul saying the same thing in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things which we have heard from me, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So we're not entrusting uh, things to just be written down and passed down and hopefully someone will get it later down. We are entrusting these to, to people. That's how the gospel is entrusted. That's how the mysteries of God are entrusted. That's the... One of the glories of God is that he is God and he has entrusted uh, worthless, uh, selfish, sinful people to be entrusted with the greatest promises and the greatest means of grace in the earth. And it's our, it's our job to uh, be faithful, figure those out, uh, seek the Lord, and then pass those down. And so grab your book list, your foundational book list in the last 10 minutes. Um, and so we have, this is just another resource we provide to help everybody grow. Um, these books are free in the library. You can check them out. You don't have to buy them on Amazon. You can check them out in the library and return them. You can also buy them downstairs. You can, uh, if you don't know where the library is or you don't know how to use it, because there are a lot of other books in there, you can see my wife, Noelle, in the lobby. She's the librarian, uh, and she knows where that's all at. Ask me, I can take you down there, um, right? So Josiah created another resource that I saw this morning, which is more like a checklist, and it shows you which books are on Kindle, how long they are, how many pages, and so, because uh, you might look at this and say, well, I want to start small, and I don't know where to start small, because then I'd have to get all these books and size them up and compare the pages and see which ones have big words and little words, and uh, that's a lot of work, so I guess I'll just not do that, right? I can tell you. Well, Josiah's resource will help you with that. I can tell you where to start. Your discipleship group leader will tell you where to start. Any of the elders or leaders on our leadership team can tell you where to start and can help you, right? We, again, we're not a movement. We're not a church that says, here, you go take this, go home for a week, come back, don't report, just give a thumbs up, you know, to make me feel good and pretend like you're mature, right? We're the, one of the gifts that uh, Christ gave to his church is shepherds who care for the sheep. We just want to help you. Um, I don't know who cares for everybody um, that's here today, but you can, you're more than welcome to talk to me afterwards, invite yourself over to my house, have dinner, we'll eat ice cream. If you don't like ice cream, pity's on you. You can watch me eat ice cream and we'll figure something out for you. Um, and we'll talk about it. We could, uh, and that's all you have to do and we'll do the rest. Um, well, we can't, we don't read it to you, but that's what book groups are for. Uh, and so each one of these has been designed. Another disclaimer, uh, there's like eight disclaimers, so <laughs> sit tight. Another, uh, this really isn't a disclaimer, is that each one of these has, we've chosen books. It's sometimes they, there's books that go off and come on. We keep it to a list of 12 so that you can read them in a year. They're not huge volumes and they're not above a, a normal public American high school reading level. That means everybody, they're accessible to everybody, right? Um, everybody that comes here. I don't know if this, uh, and that also means, you know, all the people that we regularly talk with and regularly know, uh, as far as I know, this is accessible for everybody. Um, and there's other book lists that are a little bit more academic. Uh, and so, third disclaimer. Um, just as you read these, um, they're meant to go, there's 12 books, so you can read one a month for a year. Some of them are shorter and easier to read, uh, but they're all easy to read. 
And, but just because we put this on the book list, it doesn't mean that uh, we agree with every single word and line and jot and tittle that's in the book. We're talking about big concepts. Just like the articles were just meant to, hey, why don't you think about this? Why don't you think about like how deeply you actually think you know the gospel? Why don't you think, um, why don't you rethink what discipleship is? Why don't you rethink what the church is? Uh, those are just like things you can read in 15 minutes that will hopefully the Holy Spirit will spark in your mind. Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that as deeply as Christ wants me to think about it. And so that means uh, you read the article, it's 15 minutes tops, and you're like, what do I do now? Um, and so I'd point you to this resource, uh, the foundational book list. And so um, let's just go through these real quick in the next uh, five to eight minutes. And I'm just going to give you a really quick overview. And so if uh, you can use this list and you can check it off and keep track, just like we suggest, many people suggest in their Bibles of making like tick marks to what books they've read uh, to keep track of it to, to figure out what you haven't read, right? Um, I would do like a side story, but we don't have time for side stories. Uh, we do after lunch though. Or during lunch. And so God's Big Picture, Tracing the Storyline of the Bible by Vaughn Roberts. If you don't understand and if you don't get that the Bible is 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, and they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, written over a course of about 2,000 years by, uh, I think, 40 different authors. But there's one main, God is the author, he has inspired the scriptures, and they're not, none of these books are disconnected. No Bible verse is disconnected from any other Bible verse in the entire Bible, right? They are all interwoven. And so if you don't know the big story, the, or even just the timeline, the historical timeline of the scriptures or the major themes, like what is God trying to uh, show us here? What does he want us to understand? That's a good place to start because um, reading the Bible takes about a year at a normal rate with people with jobs or go to school, uh, 12 to 18 months. But if you want to uh, read scripture and supplement with a book that would help you to understand the bigger picture of the Bible, that's a great place to start. Uh, today's Gospel, Authentic or Synthetic, Walter Chantry. Uh, we use that. That's a short book. Uh, he goes over the, um, the account where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks him, uh, what does he have to do? And so he uses that account in the Gospels to just start to question the Gospel that we're preaching today that we've heard, that we've lived in, uh, just to show out there, it just might be a little bit more watered down than, than you suppose. And I'm, I mean for everybody. I don't mean <clears throat> for those churches out there. I mean for us. And so do you really understand the Gospel? That's a good book to start. Basic Christianity, John Stott. It's a little bit thicker. I think it's like 150 pages or something. Um, 120, big print, shorter. Yeah, and so that's an easy, that's another easy read of like what is what do we believe about Jesus? What do the Gospels say? Right, this is like Orthodox Christianity. Um, I didn't grow up in a church that recited any creeds, so I was never taught any doctrine. I didn't care. I didn't listen anyways. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, maybe they were teaching something good. Probably. Uh, should have been listening. But, but I didn't have a heart for it or care. But Basic Christianity by John Stott is a, just a good introduction to what is like basic Christian beliefs that every Christian believes. Right? Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer. Uh, if you do anything as just homework this week, I frequently, maybe once a year or something, uh, read just the introduction where back in the 60s, A.W. Tozer is purporting as a theologian in America, from Canada into America, of that, um, that the culture is on the decline and the churches are, uh, are steadily getting worse and worse and less gospel-centered and affecting the culture worse. Uh, 50 years ago, and if you think it's gotten better since the 60s, again, come over for dinner. Um, and then he's saying because of our, our knowledge of God, even in, from basic theology, in churches is, is so low. And that was 50 years ago, and I would say that that problem um, has increased. I, I actually just read a study. 
it was by like Arizona Christian University, um, where the they polled a certain number of people. I don't know how they did the poll, but it was like 67% of Christians that they polled uh, claimed to be Christians. 60, 67% of people they polled claimed to be Christians. Of that 67%, only 9% of who claimed to be a Christian had a biblical worldview of like what the Bible says and a knowledge of what Christianity and what Jesus has purported. 9%. And so if you think you're above that, or you think you're better than that, uh, you may be, but it's worth studying. But that's the culture we live in. Um, there's very little knowledge of, of God, of the Bible, out there, and just in our churches. And it's, as a discipleship shepherding movement, it's, it's not our goal to put that on other people or say other churches, or we don't care about that. Uh, we work with people. We work with everybody. We want to see everybody that the Lord has entrusted to us come to maturity, which is you and people at the 1030 when they're here. Um, Total Forgiveness Experience, a study guide to repairing relationships by R.T. Kendall. Uh, you could read Total Forgiveness, which is his, his book. The experience is a practical worksheet of what are some areas in my life uh, that, I need, that I have bitterness and unforgiveness that I haven't pressed out, right? Um, uh, and we can go into, uh, we have Bible sheets on forgiveness. We have Bible sheets on bitterness and, and what it does to you. Um, there's a, a great sermon in our, on our uh, podcast about uh, just titled, Forgiveness is the prerequisite to discipleship, um, and so that and so that's huge. If you haven't worked through any bitterness or unforgiveness um, <clears throat> in your life, uh, that's a great place to start. Yeah, and then, then we have another one on true and false forgiveness. I think I'll do the Bible studies practical resources next week, or not next week, but next time I'm up here. And so. <clears throat> Biblically, what is true forgiveness and what is false forgiveness, right? Uh, in the next four minutes, we'll try to get through the rest of the list. Church membership, how the world knows who represents Jesus. Jonathan Lehman, I would put out there, just me personally, I think um, out of all our theologies out there, one of our lowest theologies in the West is ecclesiology or what is the church. And so that'll help you get a better idea of Christ's mission for the church, what is its purpose, and how do we identify with Christ. Um, uh, the Discipline Life, The Marks of, Christ, of Christian Maturity, Richard S. Taylor. Uh, I read that every year, every January. Uh, every January, it is extremely helpful to me. Um, if, you're, if you're pietistic, if you're more uh, Jesus is in heaven, ethereal, and he wants me to have a good heart, uh, read this book. Um, and it's not just if you struggle with being a disciplined person with like making your bed or something. Uh, that's like the first thing he suggests and but I don't want to get But I read, it every, I read that every year because it's extremely helpful to me and it keeps me on track of um, what am I doing with my life? How am I actually you know, working for Christ and, and the gospel? Family Worship, Joel Beakey. Uh, extremely short book. I think that's like 40 pages and it's like, you know, like one of those half books or something. Um, that's just really easy. You could read that in an afternoon. It's a quick... Uh, 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 idea opener, mind opener to like, hey, um, like I know I go to church, but like do I have any like personal responsibility in my home uh, to help my husband or wife or kids or roommates worship the Lord on a daily basis? Uh, might be something worth studying. Um, especially, there's a, well, I'll throw that in. These, this is just the easy ones. There's one by Jay Alexander, um, Thoughts on Family Worship, which is just as like, diary entries on family worship through the ages and uh, he was a uh, post-Puritan um, who just made observations about how uh, just family worship changes the culture. But So, Family Worship um, by Joel Beakey. Really short. The Holy Spirit in You, a study guide to the spirit-filled life. Dennis and Rita Bennett. Right? About how do we live a life if Christ is all about uh, you will see power from on high and then you'll be my witnesses eventually to the whole world, uh, how do we live a spirit-filled life in Christ? How do we get more of the Holy Spirit? Can we get more of the Holy Spirit? How do we live a life that isn't all just uh, dry, this is what I do with my Christian life, uh, uh, 
in one minute. I do have a sidebar. I talk to the guy. I love going to Wright State and talking to people because you meet new people and they talk uh, when they do talk. And I like talking. Um, and he was like, man, one of the main qualms I have with Christians, and he's a Christian, uh, is that like there's people out there that say they love Jesus and they just, they just got no passion. And I'm like, yeah, man, I feel it. I get it. Let's go wake them up or something. Um, but right, how do we live a spirit-filled life as, as Jesus described it? Uh, an eschatology of victory, G. Marcellus Kick. Uh, we as a church don't say, you know, with all these things, is you have to believe this to be in good standing with us. Um, I, don't even, I don't even like using a lot of times certain uh, uh, theological terms because you already have a preconceived idea in your mind of what that means, and that might not mean what I mean, but as long as you have a view or as long as we're uh, on the same track in one mind that uh, Jesus' church is going to storm the gates of hell, we are going to be victorious, the church isn't going to be defeated, the gospel is wherever the gospel preached, it will be fruitful, um, then, then we're on the same track. And so opening up your uh, ideas to go a little bit deeper onto what is the, the mission that we're here, what's the end goal, right? What are we going to do? Uh, when Heaven Invades Earth, A Practical Guide to the Life of Miracles uh, by Bill Johnson. Um, I didn't put another disclaimer on there, but I guess I could have. Uh, just because we like one book from one person doesn't mean we like books from or theology from everybody. I know some people in here might take qualms with uh, a few of these theologians and people. Um, we can talk about that. Again, we're open to talking. Uh, we love talking. Um, but that's about like how do we live like when Jesus said... Uh, like when he said, you'll receive power from on high, and when the disciples went out, and Paul did miracles, Peter did miracles, other people like Stephen, who aren't named as apostles, did miracles, and as proof that the gospel is powerful, that Jesus is alive, that the resurrection is real, and that the living, the living Lord Jesus Christ reigns here now, fills us with his spirit, and he is just uh, doing things, right? Uh, how do we live a life of, of and not just being filled with the spirit and our pietistic ways, but how do we live a life in the spirit the way the disciples did, right? Um, that's a good thing to press out. And lastly, Francis McNutt's Deliverance from Evil Spirits. Um, of another introduction, uh, a basic study on deliverance, on, on, on demons. You can call that demonology, I guess, if you want. Um, but are demons real? Do they still exist today? Where are they? What do we do about it? If you haven't thought about those, then maybe the Lord wants you to study that uh, and press that out. And that's these, so these are good studies to, to start. Again, these are just starting guides. This is how we can practically help people. Um, this is one resource that we use on a regular basis. We put it in our visitors' packets because we even want to say, hey, we just want to help you come to maturity. We want to do what we can. We will... I can't make you read books. I can't make you want to study. I can't make you read the Bible. I can't make you get on a Bible reading plan. I can't uh, make you want to get baptized in the Spirit. I can't, I can't make you do anything, right? Unless I uh, put you in a headlock and make you submit or something. Even then, you don't want to do it, and there's not going to be any, any fruitful. Um, and so this is just a resource we're throwing out there that we say we want to help you grow. We want to bring you to maturity. These books... Um, open your mind to something deeper that's biblical, right? You have to become a reader. You have to become um, a man or woman who, who loves knowledge, who seeks knowledge, who increases knowledge. And in our culture, I'm not talking to people out in, uh, in um, West India. I'm only talking to people in Southeast India on the video cast. Uh, and I know all of them. And uh, uh, a quick welcome if they're watching to our brothers and sisters in Vijawada, who is a little bit farther north, uh, northwest. Um, but I know everybody here, everybody knows how to read, everybody has the capabilities, and we're trying to increase the knowledge of God. Everybody could read books, and they're all palpable. And if you think it's hard, I think you're right. But we're here to help. Um, and come over to my house and we'll eat ice cream and talk about it. And so, again, these are, this is just one other resource that we want to help you grow in. And you can grab it. You can attain it. Uh, it is doable. Um, I'll save 
side stories for a few weeks, whenever I'm talking later. But I was never a studious person until I became a Christian or academic person. And so it's only been eight years. And so let's end in prayer. Uh, Father, we just uh, beseech your grace that you'd pour on us uh, the, the, um, the precious promises and knowledge of our Lord, uh, of Jesus Christ, of the knowledge of him, the power of him, the glory of him uh, that you bestow us. Cause us to think in the, about these things, to press them out, to increase in, in faith, in virtue, in knowledge, in self-control, uh, and brotherly affection and steadfastness and, and in love so that we would be fruitful Christians for your kingdom, Lord, in every area that you've called us to, in every way that that means, through your grace, and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.